So before we get into the panel, I'd like to um, answer that last question that was sent in over the little computer thingy. Um, and I'm going I'm to pitch a paper that I did with a colleague of mine here, which I'm sure many of you know, Professor Richard Barker. We wrote a so-called green paper, which was UK construction, which I wasn't familiar with. And the title was, Should FASB and the ISB Set Standards for Non-Financial Information? And in December, we had a debate at Oxford Union. Colin was there. Um, it's been videoed. It's on YouTube. Uh, the two teams were brilliant. Um, I wasn't on either one, so I'm not boasting in any way. You can take a look at that. Um, and it's a very interesting question. I mean, it's a very interesting question because we have standards for financial information, and those came from the state. There were no market solutions, but I'm not going to get into that in detail. But I'd still like to comment on the remarks of the two MBA students, and then I'll tee up my panel. It was interesting to me what Rafine said about Dean Peter Tufano, that at least he was a little afraid of him, and maybe some of you too. I first met Peter when he was a graduate student at the Harvard Business School. I was a professor. I hope he was afraid of me. <laughs> I'm not sure if he was. I'm going to check this afternoon. And I'm going to tell him, at least you are afraid of him. And I'm sure that'll make his day, because he flew in overnight from Boston. He's a little jet lagged. When Isadora was talking about this company that rhymes with Google, uh, whose mission is to make information available freely all over the world for people to use, I studied the sustainability reporting of a company like that. And I have to tell you that their sustainability reporting, their non-financial metrics were minimalist at best. Any concept of materiality for an internet business wasn't there. And an interesting juxtaposition is that I studied some other industries. You may find this surprising. The non-financial disclosures of ExxonMobil are far superior to those of this company whose name rhymes with Google that is being kind of fronted by something that has 26 letters. But I'm not going <laughs> to get into that in detail. All right, so let's talk about this panel. <laughs> to be honest, I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> this is like an impossible task. The power of finance to achieve purpose in business. Rafine has already made a pretty elegant argument why Finance is actually getting in the way of purpose. Short-term markets, people trying to play the earnings game. It's a big question. You know, is there a role for finance to support purpose in business? There are people who say that the financial sector has become a beast that exists to feed itself. If you look at the size of the financial sector, you look at its market cap, you look at its revenues, it's grown tremendously. If you look at the number of financial instruments that are out there, basically to just create trading opportunities, there's this divorce that's taken place between the financial sector and the real economy that I think is a real concern. On the other hand, there's those optimists who say, look, if we look at the sustainable development goals, there's this $2.5 to $3 trillion a year funding gap, and that's going to have to come from the private sector. It's going to have to come from the public markets. Uh, because governments alone are not going to be able to do that. 2.5 to $3 trillion a year is a lot of money. And it's a lot of money that comes from the way the value chain works in financial services. And there's issues. And fortunately, we have a member of each piece of the supply chain in the audience. And you're going to have to convince me that there is a role for finance in supporting purpose in business, because these people are in the real world. On my right, we almost met last year, but I got Nova virus, so we didn't. <laughs> if you've never had it, don't get it. It's awful. Jacek Sarzinski, he was a CFO at Mars for many years. He's now CEO of Prep Panera Holding Company. So he's a corporate. And people like him need money from people like Timothy Wong from DBS in Singapore. They make loans. They've got an asset management business. They have a wealth management business. 
And if you're a listed company or when you become a listed company, they could buy your stock or not. Now, DBS of Singapore works for people like Temasek. And we have from Temasek, Neo Gimhui, who's the managing director of enterprise development. She's an asset owner. The asset owners set contracts with the asset managers, could be short term, people say, that put short term pressure on people like Yasik. I feel your pain. I'm just saying. My cleanup batter is Veronica Poole. We were together at the debate at Oxford Union. She's the UK head of accounting and global IFRS leader. She's an accountant. And so her role is to keep everybody else in the capital markets honest, okay? So she makes sure that the numbers that he cooks up and he knows how to do it because he was a CFO, <laughs> that get reported to people like him that make decisions and they have to give people like her that they're doing a good job. So that's the issue that we're gonna grapple with today. Is it possible for the financial sector to contribute to purpose and business? And Yasik, let's start with you. Thank you, it was very eloquent. Um, <laughs> so first of all, probably I am the product of, uh, of this announcement, which I was also made aware today that Mars is going externally with the catalyst. I've been many years in the company. I love this company and I learned a lot. And I've been working with Bruno and his team for many years because I always believed in um, the construct of economics of mutuality because, you know, it's deeply rooted in my personal upbringing. I am the product, uh, product of post-war reality of my parents, uh, social injustice infused by, you know, communism in my country. Um, and, I, and, uh, and Christian values that I always, you know, espouse to. And um, I don't know why, why I joined actually finance world, uh, frankly speaking, <laughs> but because, uh, you know, you I, be, because, uh, because I just like numbers, but I also like sports and piano. I was a <laughs> pianist for many years. And um, the, uh, uh, the, I deeply believe that um, because I was exposed to injustice uh, in many different forms, I do believe that there is a way to actually do good and do well. And um, I had privilege to be working with a fantastic companies that actually I didn't need to do anything else but just to follow uh, the leadership of the, of, the, of the great thought from many years ago. And um, I think that um, there is responsibility on everyone uh, who has a position of power and influence to try to do good and do well. And uh, this is the course of action I took most of my time in my life. Um, in my previous jobs where I was in, in leading finance function, I always tried to be practical. And uh, Martin who sits uh, here on stage, he, he taught me a lot about practicality in business because as much as I'd like to be hugging trees and showing how great uh, you know, planet is, we have to be practical in many ways how we execute business challenges. And, and uh, what I learned in those years is adding dreams with practicality. And first practical things that I was doing in my jobs as a finance leader was to balance the financial and non-financial metrics on our strategy on the page document because um, I do believe that the world is overly steered financially, and I do believe that strategy of the business should be subordinate to deliver any of the sustainable growth strategy, and financial metrics should be part, very important, but byproduct of this activity. And, um, and I also believe that, that the capital structure that each company has, has a massive influence on what you're going to work on. We spoke with me before the panel about uh, sustainable eating solutions in Asia. I'm uh, working now in the you know, modern beverage and food solutions where we deal every single day with hundreds of millions of consumers asking ourselves question, how to provide them with nutritious, safe, good tasting solution, and at the same time make those who serve them 
feeling responsible, inclusive of the ownership structure of their own company. So I do believe that on top of using non-financial metrics, the ownership structure is important to create what I would call owner-manager model, where every person who is working in your company, or at least a certain level, has the skin in the game. Not because uh, you want to create financial wealth, but financial wealth is a huge part of the composition to remove people out of poverty. And, um, and I think that um, this is the first thing that I was trying to do you know, in my previous job. And you, know, and, uh, and you can do this on every single level in the organization. And I, I was really flabbergasted listening to Isadora and, and you um, uh, with your speeches, with your passionate speeches. Uh, and uh, I can only reassure you that businesses need people like you uh, combined with the practicalities of how to deliver on what you guys believe in. Because we are all here serving the future you. Uh, you are entering the, you know, the age of decision-making process and consumer. And uh, this is the most important thing. So just a real quick question before I turn it to Timothy. So you talked about non-financial metrics. We had a little chat over lunch. Um, the financial institutions you dealt with, I mean, you weren't listed, but you probably had bank loans. Were they interested at all in non-financial metrics, the financial institutions you dealt with? Should they be? Surprisingly, yes. I have to tell you. I am working in an investment company now that invests long term in a growing you know, companies. We are investors and we buy companies that we like. But we also finance our activities with significant amount of debt. Um, um, and each company is leveraged. Uh, and the leveraging depends on how fast they do this and what partners they, they deal with. And there's a growing um, uh, amount of institutions, including financial institutions, who ask very important questions which are being discussed you know, here in, you know, at this moment, not just you know, asking for your sustainability report, but how sustainable is your business model for the long term um, uh, part that you are asking the debt to be served. So I do think this, this no longer is an academic uh, you know, question. It bec the impact, so-called impact investment, we already deal with impact investors that have $500 billion of assets under, under management. Of course, it's the drop in the ocean with trillions of dollars of, of, of assets under management, but you know, there is close to a trillion dollar uh, next year that it will be uh, committed to impact investing. It's encouraging. Yeah. Timothy, what's your view? So I think um, <clears throat> there are a few thoughts that you know, come to mind as I think about this question, uh, the power of finance to impact purpose in business. And you know, it's said of uh, like fire, right? Finance is a, is a good servant, but a bad taskmaster. And in some sense, if you get into a trap of debt and, and you know, excessive debt, excessive interest rates, it puts people into great difficulty financially, but use responsibly um, the right amount of capital placed in the right hands at the right time uh, with the right means to monitor it can be very powerful and, and, and very uh, liberating uh, for billions of people around the world who are so caught in, you know, in a poverty trap, much as what uh, was talked about this gentleman in Bangladesh. Um, in, in a sense, uh, in DBS, we feel a certain interesting weight of responsibility, if not even a sense of calling. Uh, as, a, as the Development Bank of Singapore, that kind of, we're a very young bank, we're 50 years old as a bank, and uh, you know, began when Singapore gained its independence from, from, from the Federation of Malaya. And it's interesting that we've been on this journey as a bank, um, it's kind of a two-step journey. About five years ago, um, the leadership of the bank, uh, led by our CEO, started us on this journey to ask if we could reimagine banking. Uh, and it was pretty much from the digital lens, right? Asking the question, since banking really is about set, a set of ones and zeros, it's all about book entries in a computer system. If we didn't figure out how to reinvent banking, uh, our real competitors won't be the city banks and the JP Morgans of this world, they'll be the Alibabas and the Googles of this world. And so we kind of plunged head in 
into this whole idea of how can we reinvent banking, leveraging digital. We kind of set this goal, you know, um, in 2015, is one of these BHAG goals to become the best bank in the world by the year 2020. Um, and we were sort of surprised last year that two magazines voted DBS as the best bank in the world. And that created a bit of a conundrum because then the senior management started scratching their heads and asking this question, what do you do for a rejoinder? Um, and so there were jokes thrown around about being the best bank in the universe, et cetera, as the next goal. But we had a very interesting inflection point in December last year, and actually it happened shortly after um, I went to, out to visit uh, Jay in, in, in his offices in, in Virginia. Um, and I came back and I, I was sitting in a management meeting and we were discussing this question, you know, what do we, what's our next mission statement? And I just had this thought after listening about economics of mutuality and thinking about this idea, what if we change our mission statement from being best bank in the world which is kind of a very self-serving vision, to being best bank for the world. And a colleague kind of added in the word better. And so we that, have that now as kind of our, uh, you know, raison d'etre, if you will. Can DBS be the best bank for a better world, right? And that, what does that mean in the context of Asia, which has, uh, as we talk now, 4.5 billion people in 10 years' time, will be 5 billion people, many of whom are still struggling uh, below the poverty line, and how can DBS play this role of really um, intermediating capital? Now, let me just say one, one other thing, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll you know, pass it on. If you look at what banking is as a core function, if we look at the actual utility of the banking system, it plays the role of taking people who have surplus capital, right, intermediating it to others who have use for that capital, charging them a rate of interest, okay, getting a return on that capital from the ones using the capital, putting a price on it, and then essentially passing that back on to the ones supplying the capital. Now, what banks have done uh, in the past, or the reason banking has been such a profitable business is because of the complexity and the opaqueness in these transactions. And so, it's what a, a, a trader would call a spread, huge spreads, elephant spreads. In fact, the more complex the situation, the higher those spreads can be. And what that effectively means when you look at the ecosystem of financing is essentially the people receiving the capital are paying excessive rates of interest, and that's basically usury, right? And the people that are supplying the capital are given as little as they possibly can, and the bankers make all the money in the middle. Now, if that is what banking has become, actually, that's a fantastic opportunity because it means it's a highly efficient ecosystem. And I think that the opportunity, if you combine this idea of what digital disruption can do, which is to basically what, what digital disruption has done in the world today is it's taken all of these of opaqueness and has made things completely transparent. And effectively, you could basically play a role, or a, 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 if we thought about what it meant to be the best bank for a better world, the whole question is how can we as a bank make less, as a bank, and provide cheaper loans to the right customers, the right amount to the ones that need it and are doing the right things with it, and provide as high a possible a return to those supplying capital. Now, let me just end up by saying, and so that's what I think our, our focus and our vision has been, and that's completely in line with this idea of the economics of mutuality. Now, for us in Singapore, it's a very interesting situation. Singapore is a small country with 5.5 million people. We are the largest bank in Singapore. In fact, the largest bank in South Asia by assets. But if we sat down and we thought about if we were to approach this, we're a tiny bank relative to the, the Chinese banks. We're, we're not, I mean, we're about the same size as the largest Indian banks. But if DBS thought about this problem, if I were to use our digital platform, Right? And I basically found a solution to allow a, a billion Indians to basically save money. And I collected 50 cents from every single one of them to help them to grow their savings. Right? That's a $500 million revenue opportunity for DBS. If it was all done digitally, your cost would be really low. Right? And think about how fast they will be growing as they're doing a good job of using those savings for education and other things as their wealth grows. That 50 cents becomes a dollar, it becomes a dollar 20, a dollar 50. The compounding is also very strong. 
So I think in a, in a nutshell, um, we're, we're still early in this journey, but I think when we, when we put out this rallying cry just in December last year of becoming the best bank for a better world, it really involves us re-looking at the business of banking and asking how can we reinvent banking, leveraging what digital disruption now offers us to make the world a better place. So real quick before I turn it over to Neil Gim, I'm going to ask you a really complicated question. But I'm going to take a lesson from the MC, the previous one. It's not going to be yes or no, but I'm going to let you do it on a scale of 1 to 10. Okay? So here's the question. There's two parts. The first part is if you look at the banking industry in general and the way you describe the business model, opaqueness, high margins, elephant spreads, on a scale of 1 to 10, to what extent do you think the banking sector would support the economics of mutuality? in the companies they do business with. With 10 would be the banking system is you know, just doing a bang up job. One would be, no, it's like a major drag. One to 10, the banking system supporting the economics of mutuality. So they're, they're really, so I'll answer your question with a two part answer. <laughs> Make it even more complex. <laughs> just one to 10, then we'll, we'll open okay. one to 10. So I wanna, I wanna get to all right, the fine. asset owner. But in terms of the business Those of banking. Those are words, that's not a number. Your question is. I just want a number from 1 to 10. 10 is good, 1 is bad. Of how the banks do in terms of supporting? The, the banking system as it exists today to support the economics of mutuality. 1. OK. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well done. There's work to do. We'll talk about A lot it. of work. There's a lot of work to do. So, Neo Gim, you've got a what, $300 billion, something like that? It's about 230 US. 230 billion, US, yeah, so um, you're a major player. And you're at the top of the food chain. We, we, we are an investor, uh, we are an investment company. Um, and if you look at our website, uh, it says that we have three roles. Uh, we want to be an active investor, we want to be a forward looking institution, uh, and we also want to be a responsible steward. Right? These charter roles are not new, right? it's been there for a while. And, uh, Recently, we've also said, look, we want to do good, we want to do well, we want to do it right. It's a journey, right? Uh, so my first caveat is we're not there yet. Uh, in fact, I don't think we'll ever get there because there's always ways to make the world a better place, right? Uh, we started a much more formal process to uh, embed sustainability into our system uh, about three years ago, so the group is quite new. And the way we've organized ourselves, right, uh, and it's an evolving space, the way we've organized ourselves is threefold. Uh, how do we protect value? How do we uh, capture value? And how do we actually create value? Investors are very good at capturing value, right? Uh, protecting value to some extent, risk management, right? Um, and protecting value is very much a recognition that uh, companies of today, right, uh, will need to be resilient, not just uh, against their competitors, against uh, changes in technology, innovation, but also to be very mindful about what are the ESG considerations uh, in their various sectors. Uh, and what we've, what we've started to do is to get all our investment professionals to be sensitized. Right? So each time they want to do an investment in a particular geography, in a particular industry, right, uh, there is a playbook that actually says, look, these are the major issues that confront this industry. Right? Uh, please engage the company to make sure that uh, you are aware of what those risks are that the management of that company actually has a good sense and is actually on a track towards uh, making their own indices better, right? Uh, I'll just call this ESG. And to some extent, it's more a reactive, a compliance-driven strategy. How do we capture value? Uh, I think uh, earlier this morning, people have spoke about $12 trillion of investment opportunities in sustainable development, right? Uh, we are actually looking at how do we look at a lot of these new businesses, new business models, that are addressing sustainability-related challenges, right? Uh, impact investment uh, is, is not a new term uh, in a philanthropic world, uh, but a lot of mainstream investors are also starting to get into the space, and we are looking to see how do we deploy capital to try to support these businesses uh, that are able to do well and also do good to scale faster, right? Uh, you might have heard of Impossible Burgers, we're an investor. These are the guys that are innovating around meatless meats, Right, uh, so there are a lot of new food tech companies in, uh, that's going into this space. Waste management, right? Uh, there are companies looking at how do they uh, repurpose uh, waste into into wealth, right? Uh, into useful products. Uh, so it is a bit of putting it, uh, putting more focus to some of these emerging models uh, that we believe will bring sustained value in the long run. 
The third area of work that we focus on is what I'll call uh, the issues of the commons. <coughs> right? And the reality is that there are issues today that businesses, governments, NGOs on their own are unable to address by themselves. Right? Uh, take, for example, in Singapore, air pollution. Right? Uh, this, the, that everyone suffers from it. How do you address this problem? Not so easy, right? Uh, it's very it's, it's systemic. It goes down to what happens in the communities. It talks about alleviating poverty, but at the same time, also around deforestation. And uh, how do you try to come to a much better outcome uh, and, and bridge across the needs of the various different uh, groups? Uh, so what we've actually done uh, over the last few years is to start uh, working with non-traditional partners. Right, uh, so we've, we're talking to NGOs, the scientists, governments proactively to try to see how we can actually put solutions on the table right, uh, that can actually help address this uh, so-called common, common challenges. Right? Uh, the work is very much in the beginning. Right? Uh, I actually think that uh, finance has a big role to play uh, to, to help achieve purpose in business. Uh, in fact, um, many, many of my uh, peers and counterparties right, uh, we are all trying to um, understand right, uh, and be creative in how we can actually find solutions right, uh, to help channel um, uh, solutions to, to the market. So quick yeah. question for you. You made a, a rightful distinction between ESG as kind of a compliance exercise versus impact, and they're different things. Measuring impact is harder. Yasek talked about $500 billion. Um, the term is being used very broadly, as you said. I mean, it's gone from the kind of classic private impact investing markets the way the term is used at Temasek, do you, do you have an impact investing portfolio? Is your intention to create a specific impact investing portfolio? Or are you trying to assess the impact that you're having across you know, all of your investments, whatever the, whatever the asset class? Yeah. Um, both. And it's a difficult question, right? Uh, and I, I hesitate before I say that because we're not there yet. Right, um, we are asking ourselves, what do we want to measure at the portfolio level? Right, uh, if you actually measure across all 17 sustainable development goals, and by the way, there are 169 targets, 232 indicators, it becomes a whole data, data exercise that then is like, what is it for? Right, um, so what we've actually done uh, within our portfolio is actually to say, look, all businesses that we own, can you actually think about your business purpose, right? And please orientate yourselves towards your purpose. It's not just about profit. Profit is a consequence of the fact that you are actually doing things in a way that, that the market actually finds uh, efficient, right? Uh, it's, it's what you're serving, what the market needs. But go back to what's your business purpose. But there are actually two SDGs that we've actually zoomed in on, right? Uh, and we feel that there's an urgency around this. One is climate change. Uh, the second one is around waste, which is uh, around sustainable production and consumption, right? So we are likely to want to start tracking how we are doing against these two SDGs because there's a real urgency around that. Uh, so how do we measure that impact? Uh, I think it's also something that we are, we are grappling with, right? It's easy to say, look, we want to do something positive against climate change, but what is the right metric to measure, right? And how do we actually uh, make sure that these are all science-based, right? Uh, and there is actually an acceleration towards the outcomes that we want to see. Right, uh, so for me, I'm optimistic about the future, but I'm pessimistic about the pace in which we're moving towards it. Right, uh, I think there is uh, urgency in this. There's a lot of uh, issues around the SDGs that we all want to personally champion, right? Uh, but when it comes to the climate, when it comes to waste generation, I think this is something where collectively we can all do something about it. Do we have an impact portfolio, right? Uh, we have companies that are a lot more driven towards impact, right? The intentionality, the corollary is, is a lot more intimate. Uh, and we are actually, um, you'll hear more about this over the next few, next few months, we've started to deploy capitals to this so-called impact funds, right? Uh, and we actually want to do a lot more in, in this space, right? Uh, but even how do you measure what is an impact business is something that is still being debated and is, is an evolving space, right? Uh, because to all extent, businesses all have some externalities, positive as well as negative. Right? And uh, all businesses can claim some association with the SDGs, right? Uh, so then the question is, what is the right uh, way to, to think about this space and what, what is the right lens to use? And it's, it's evolving, right? So I don't think I have an answer today, but it, these are all things that we're struggling with and grappling with uh, within the institution. Great. Thank you. So there's been this theme before here, kind of metrics, measurement, 
Um, it's often cited as one of the barriers to the role of the finance sector in supporting businesses for purpose. Fortunately, we have an expert on measurement, Veronica Poole. We have, we have the accountant who's going to tell us what needs to be done. Well, I think before you answer the question of how to, I think you need to answer the question of what. And I think this conversation has highlighted to me one of the interesting dilemmas about this morning's discussion. There seems to be a contrast that many of the speakers have put between the word finance versus good. Uh, you defined finance very much as banking finance. These are not my definitions. We as humanity, as individuals, as businesses, whether privately owned or publicly owned, we all do one of the many things. Every day we get up in the morning and we embark on the process of creating value, transforming value, destroying value, or consuming value. So we all have an amazing ability to transform the world through our value transformation process. Now, a lot of speakers talked about purpose being separate somehow from finance. But what's value? What is value? And what is finance? Finance is simply the way we capture and explain and transact that value. So if I can direct the flow of capital to the right thing at the right time, I'll be in a good place. So what's the right thing? Let us talk about the right thing. Is the right thing some sort of CSR activity? A number of people talked about doing the right thing in terms of directing value to societal purpose, to SDGs in isolation. I don't think that's going to work in any system, socialist, capitalist. You cannot separate those two things. Value has to be created and divided and shared appropriately, agreed, given. So we all agreed, and I think a lot was said, that you know, just pure profit grabbing, that's not the right definition of value. I think we kind of moved away from that, and I think the world's moved on from the 80s in that regard. So maybe that's right. So what is it that we're trying to direct the value to? And what I really would like to direct the value flow to is to something that is going to truly integrate some of these considerations around societal values with the traditional profitable business. Why would I like to have that integration? I'll tell you why. Because if we can create profits, if we can create that value, if we can maximize the value, we can direct it to the right thing. If we are just sat there consuming and destroying or transferring that value, the world is not becoming richer. We have to grow those crops. We actually have to feed the people. We actually have to generate value. So let's talk about value generation. To me, purpose and profit are actually inextricably linked. Yes, I agree with Larry Fink on that one. They are totally inextricably linked. One of the speakers said earlier on that doing well and doing good should not contradict each other. They can go together. I actually think that doing well is not possible without doing good because you would not have the license to operate, not for a long time, if you are not doing the right things. And that's, again, Larry's point, so I'm not saying anything new here, so a number of you will have studied and read his speeches. I agree with that statement. And vice versa, if I go the other way around, doing good is not possible without doing well. You will not have generated any value to direct it to the right spot. So the two are in inextricably linked. They have to go together. Now, for that to happen, I need to know what I'm doing, so I need to embed the purpose in everything I do. It really does need to become the DNA of a business. Now here, I'm a seasoned city professional. You're pondering about the accent because I have grown up in the good old Soviet Union. I have studied the socialist theory. I lived under it. And yes, I read the works of Lenin. I own up. Back in the USSR. Back in the USSR. <laughs> but for the last 
30 years I have been a city professional here in the city of London. So I have seen both sides and I studied both sides. And I will tell you what, I don't think that the capitalism should be given up upon just yet. I, I think the flow of capital can still achieve some seriously powerful results in the societies that we live in. And that is why I think what we really need to do is to integrate some of that thinking around the purpose into the business DNA. But for that to happen, you need to tackle it across all the pieces. You need to start across what matters to a business. You need to start with its governance. The corporate governance of a business needs to be fully integrating some of the thinking that we were talking about. The ESG, the environmental, the social, the governance factors, they have to be part of the day-to-day decision-making of the board. And if it is not, if it is done by some sustainability committee, if it is some sort of separate exercise that the board gets to see once a year when they approve sustainability report, or when they approve their CSR budget, we won't succeed, we will have failed. The other part that is totally important to that is risk management and strategy. This purpose that we're talking about absolutely must underpin the risk strategy and day-to-day decision-making of the management and the board. So risk strategy and management, it's a risk. Now, what business today does not understand how inextricably linked our ecosystems are, how codependent all our risks and activities are? Just look at the World Economic Forum risk report for however many years running. The map is very complex. The in- intricacies of those and the interconnectivity that exists between those risks is startling. A lot of them are non-financial. Most of them, in fact, these days, the top six, to be precise, are environmental. So let's just pause and think about this interconnectivity. So if that is the dependency of the business, dependency not just an impact of a business, but the business depends on getting that risk management right, depends on appropriate use and reliance on those resources to stay sound, resilient, long-term, sustainable. In order to create that value in a sustainable way, then I think I need to recognize that we should change the conversation from just impacts. We need to recognize the secularity of the ecosystems and that every impact is a dependency and vice versa. (coughs) There aren't any impact metrics per GRI versus sustainable development goals versus whoever else compared to dependency metrics per SASB in the US or, you know, TCFD for climate. These things are all interconnected. Let's just recognize that. Now, if I can get my management, my board, to think about this in that interconnected, circular fashion, think about dependencies and impacts, and incorporate that into the strategic thinking day to day, I'm getting there. Targets and metrics will be the next thing. And then reporting. There is another piece. In order to get these guys on my left, to make sure that whether that is finance coming from the equity fund, or from the banks is flowing to the right course, to the right business, the business that is generating value in a sustainable long way, I need transparency. I need to have the right fully integrated data in mainstream filings, not in some sustainability reports, not in some CSI and philanthropy program, which is we all love to talk about. I need that in my 10K in the US, I need that in my annual report in the UK, and that will be the only way that I will manage to comply with my new fiduciary duties, at least here in the UK, under Section 172, I have to have regard to all those broader stakeholders. So if I'm a board director and I have to demonstrate that I have had regard, well, I better have those metrics to demonstrate that I had thought about this. So and as a responsible investor, under the stewardship code here in the UK, you will also have to demonstrate that you have exercised your stewardship duties appropriately. You will need that data. And that's where I come in. You said my role is to keep the market clean and honest. So that's why I think the regulators come in. They need to 
come in and keep the market clean and honest. They need to make sure that information flow does happen. Market forces can take us only that far. But as you know well, Bob, I shared that view before in Oxford, and I will repeat that again. We are rapidly running out of time on climate. We have no time for market forces to solve this for us. We need more. And that action will have to come from many quarters, policymakers, lawmakers, regulators. Otherwise, it's too little, too late. So thank you for that. We've got a few minutes before we open up for questions. Um, thank you. There's been this theme from, you know, the sessions, you know, right before this and now around a sense of urgency. Right? It's like we know what to do, but are we doing it fast enough? And you talked about where capital needs to flow, and you basically said it's not flowing fast enough and we can't count on market forces alone to do this. So I'd like to ask you this question and every other member of the panel, and then we'll open it up to the audience. From a regulatory point of view, if you could pick one thing to change, that you think would accelerate the flow of capital to the places where we need it to go, what would it be? At this point in time? Yeah. And you just had me finish on the word climate. I would say regulate for TCFD and now across the world. The sooner, the better. The TCFD style transparency around climate related risks, scenario testing, and the ability of the investor to recognize which businesses are resilient or not is absolutely critical because otherwise we're going to have a massive shock to the financial system and very soon as the market dislocates. So you would mandate TCFD reporting? I would. Of all listed companies? Yes. Uh, in, in the, in, and their strategy has been the basic financial statement, so in the US it would be the 10K? In the 10K in and 10K. in the strategic report here in the UK and in the MDNA and every other jurisdiction. And what about private companies? I mean, there's a lot of big private companies in the world. They affect the planet too. Should they be mandated? I'm not sure I, my, how. My but... view is that it needs to be PIs, public interest entities. Yep. So all PIs. I don't, I don't differentiate. As was defined in the EU legislation. Pretty much. Right. Yeah. So, and, you know, we're not far off. TCFD recommendation being endorsed in many jurisdictions around the world as it is. So it's brought in in law in various jurisdictions already. So if I look at Australia, that's coming in not only through regulatory measures, but also through the corporate governance codes. UK is not far behind. Um, Europe is thinking about this both through the greening of the finance initiative, but also broader through the European Commission. Regulators are looking at this, but you mentioned that regulators generally follow, they yep. are a little bit too slow. I think we are all moving a little bit too slow on this one. Joachim, what would you change in regulations to speed up the flow of capital where it needs to go? I'm not sure I would use regulatory as the first tool. Yep. Right. Um, so the climate scientists have actually highlighted the tipping points in our ecosystem. Right, uh, and they've actually highlighted which are the key zones that are most sensitive, Amazon, uh, Borough Forest in Canada. And uh, they've actually listed down, uh, and this is publicly available, which are the financial institutions that are sponsoring or financing some of these activities. Right, uh, whether knowingly or un unknowingly, I would take, a, given the time urgency, I would take a much more concerted effort to, to engage the people who have direct influence, right, uh, and it's just a few institutions who have a lot of influence, in these areas to get them to, to do differently, right? Uh, so I prefer much more, given the time, right? I, I think a targeted approach uh, towards the major institutions uh, that are either financing or participating in these activities that will affect the tipping point, uh, I think would be something that uh, I would put as first, first priority. Great, thank yeah. you. Timothy? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I would go down the regulatory route if it was urgent, simply because there's so many self-interest and lobby groups that would block it. I would think the way around it is to go down the digital disruption route. I mean, we think about the way, for example, ride sharing has come up in three years and completely changed the face of transport and mobility. Um, we think about the way Airbnb is changing the lodging industry. Um, honestly, if, you, if we, think, we think it's all about providing transparency and allowing the actual people who are supplying capital to vote with their dollars, uh, going down the digital route is the way to, to really allow people to put their money where they believe it should go. And would you say the digital route is the way, the best way to kind of 
leverage the world's citizens? Yes, and it complete. I mean, it's, it's already happened with media, right? Where effectively it's become democratized. And in the same way, we could democratize finance, leveraging digital, and people knew exactly where the, and they voted with their dollars, you know, where their money should go. Um, I think that's where perhaps standards could come in to make sure that everything is true and fair and there's a platform for that. But to me, that's the way to really hit where, where people can't hide behind lobby groups and, and regulatory sort of, uh, you know, relying on regulatory infrastructure to police it. Great. So Yasek, and then I'm going to give Veronica the last word, but we'll go with Yasek first. What I like you? both. Yeah. I like regulatory response as well as digital. Just give you an example. Um, one of our companies, Panera, 2.1 thousand cafes in America, Mexico, and Canada. 35 million people on digital program every day, buying half a billion meals. Um, there was a movement created through the online community to actually get themselves organized and redistribute something that potentially was a waste into force for good. And 3.5 thousand nonprofit organization, organizations, they every day collect unsold products made on that day to redistribute and create good. And uh, without, uh, without the digital tool, we would have never done this in less than a year. And also, I think education plays a massive role. We spoke in my previous company uh, with some people that we are putting too much emphasis in our financial training to teach people more finance, more you know, um, skills which are basically institutionalizing financial thinking only. And we do not spend time from schools. I mean, maybe uh, Oxford is the different one. You quoted uh, Chicago school. Uh, we, we educate children by reward financial metrics and any other metrics with financial metrics only. And I think education has massive role to play. So one quick favor, I live in Lexington, Massachusetts, a couple of blocks from a Panera. You don't have the lobster roll back on the menu yet for the summertime. <laughs> so if you could look into that when you get back, you know, I, I'd appreciate it. I mean, it is spring and the weather's warm enough. Actually, headquarter, the headquarter is in Boston, you know. Yeah, okay, well, I'll talk to people there. So we've got nine seconds left for Veronica. Last quick point. Question, sure. rather than a comment. And the question is, where are we going to get the data to actually get the flow to the right places. Digital has its limitation. Unless you actually get the data into the market. And currently, we do not have the right data to make the right investment decisions. And I'll tell you why. Because on climate, just going back to your transition risks, who is going to be better off? BP, Shell, Exxon, who is going to be more resilient? Do you know? There will be winners, there will be losers. You know? So I've got a lot I can say about data, but I can't do that because we've got nine minutes and 36 seconds left and I have to open it up. But AI and big data is going to play a big role, just as to tease. So questions from the audience. So I'd like to go on this one from the left to the right. What is a fair profit? On a scale of one to five. <laughs> I mean, we've only got nine minutes. That's the wrong question. Okay, thank you very much. That was... <laughs> I don't, I don't... You don't look like an MBA, so you yeah. can say stupid things and you flunk, so it's not going to matter, so I, I guess you're okay. I mean, it's a great question, right? I mean, that's kind of what started this whole thing. What's the right level of profit? I mean, any, like, just real quick responses, because we do have a limited amount of time. You know, you, again, you take that one. You know, how, how do you think about the right level of profit? It's a very difficult question. It took mask off, yes. <laughs> okay, I, I guess the answer is go study marks. Next question. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So um, you mentioned that uh, profit and Who wants to take that one? Yasek, you want to take that one? I 
don't know if Coca-Cola is evil company. I love Coca-Cola. <laughs> but you know, maybe this is coming from CPG world. I, I mean, yeah. I don't have the answer to this question. I, as long as there is consumer demand uh, for products like Coca-Cola, uh, you know, who, which is striving to do also uh, all sorts of activities to remove dependence on sugar intake yeah, and going into different liquid solutions. Uh, uh. And I would just say real quick, I mean, if you look at the data, um, almost every company in every industry produces net negative externalities, e even the so-called good companies. If you look at it through the lens of the SDGs, you know, the, the corporate sector is net negative externalities, you know, and that's the difference between ESG and impact, and it's a huge challenge. It's a measurement challenge. Veronica's right, it's got to start with a capital flow challenge. Yes, ma'am. Um, so building off the question about profit, but you know, 12 years ago, Mars asked the question, what is fair, right profit? Do we need to start asking investors what is fair, right return? <laughs> Website, um, and in fact, uh, this is a recent comment, right? It doesn't say we want to maximize returns, right? We talk about uh, sustaining uh, over the long term across generations, right? Uh, I think this goes back to what is embedded in the DNA of, of, the, of the institution, of the organization. And uh, obviously, we all want to win, right? And you, you can't ask the athlete to say, look, uh, how, how fast do you want to run, right? You just run as fast as you can, right? Uh, but on the other hand, is at what price, at what cost, right? Uh, and I think that's where the moderation comes in, right? Uh, you do things, right, uh, with uh, collaboration in mind. You do things with tomorrow in mind. You do things while being very aware of the impact that it may bring, uh, whether positive or negative, to the communities and to the environment. And I would say that this is not something that this is an ongoing discovery journey, right? Because uh, all of us, even as individuals, right, there are a lot of things that we do that may have an unconscious impact on others, right, or on the environment. But with new information, with knowledge, with science, right, uh, you learn to do things better. Then the thing is, how far do you actually bring this into your culture, right? And I hope that we actually, uh, when within Tomasic, right, uh, it is a culture that we can actually continue to strengthen rather than to erode. Right, uh, in the face of capitalism, in the face of uh, uh, where, where you're pressured right, uh, to want to have to uh, um, bring returns uh, for our investment. Right? Um, if I may also add one point, which is I would caution against labeling companies as good or evil. Right? Um, I think it's a very dangerous path down. It's very divisive. Right? I think all companies do exist for a purpose. Uh, some companies do it much better. There are others with a lot more room for improvement. Right, uh, even the business activities, even how they treat their own employees, so on and so forth. Right, so there are always, there are always things that they've done well, and there are always things that they can do better. Right, uh, and I, I prefer to look at companies this way, right, uh, rather than to label them to say this is this is bad and this is, is good because good can always be better and bad can always become good. Right, uh, it's it's a journey. Timothy, want your... Yeah, I wanted to just kind of address that, but also back to the question on what's the right level of profit. And I think. Going back to the point Veronica made, it's about value, right? It's about, the question is, what value is being created? How is that value being created and how it's being distributed? Um, and then I think when you bring in the idea of what kind of capital are you drawing on and are you able to sustain the ability to create that value by reinvesting in the capital that was being drawn on, whether it's natural capital or social capital, I think that's the right question to ask. So, in a way, it's hard to answer both questions on what's the right level of return and what's the right level of uh, profit in isolation. I think it, you have to go to the basic question. How is value being created and how is it being distributed to the different suppliers of the capital? So really, I think with regards to the investor, they are the suppliers of the financial capital, right? And it's a function of the risk that they have taken uh, to supply you with that capital, and they should be therefore compensated, you know, sufficiently for that. Commensurate with the risk. With the risk, I yeah. Think the real challenge with the questions that, that both questions again, uh, the right level of profit versus the right levels of return. But I'd like to come back to the how 
can you have good or bad businesses? But actually, on that question of what's right, or what's the right level, the problem with that is, is that you can say, well, I will calculate my profit as maximum I can squeeze out of the system less that one pound to the CSR activity. That's what really worries me, because that's never going to solve the problem of capitalism. That, I think, is exactly what's going to destroy it. Mm. Philanthropy and CSR can only do that good. Yeah. If you really want to change and do a lot of good, I think you need to start thinking about the value creation. Sustainable, long-term value creation for stakeholders. Mm. Stakeholders, not just shareholders, and stakeholders multiple. That therefore goes into a question of what's good, what's bad. Can you express a moral view of what is a good company, what's a bad company? That, I think, is what the stakeholders determine. What's good, what's bad, what are they prepared to buy? Every day you get and still drive a vehicle that uses oil. You, you know, are you effectively endorsing this? Are you still endorsing fossil fuel companies? Every time you do not decide consciously on where you put your investments through your pensions or ISIS, you're funding those companies that are destroying our planet. Those are the decisions that are driven by society and stakeholders at large. I don't think it would be appropriate for an individual bank or an investor to turn around and say, no, no. This is this is a bad company. So I think we've got but we've got time for one. Does your little that little artificial intelligence device you've been carrying around? Yeah. Does it have a question? It does. Wow. So, there we go. Someone else has submitted a question. Uh, we've talked a lot about those with influence making a difference, uh, but we're in a business school uh, with a bunch of MBAs. So, what would you suggest those in lower levels of the organizations you work in can do to drive some of this change? That's a great question. Who great wants to question. take it? Can I do it? Sure, do it. Because that's the question we are trying to tackle with in Deloitte. So we employ nearly 300,000 people around the world. Imagine each and every person were able to make a difference on climate. How would you do that? You know, that's the question we are asking ourselves at the moment. Yes, I can minimize my footprint as a business. I can improve my real estate. I can go on to renewable energy. I can decide what pension funds I invest. I can put principles into my supply chain. Tick, 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 all en route, all being done, all thinking about, all trying to solve. But what if every professional in my business then turned around and said, I advise so many clients, so many companies, what if I advise them on the right strategies on their supply chain? What if I advise them on how to do measurement to get the right data into the market and change the investment flow? What if I provide assurance around some of those metrics so that people can rely on them and I do that across the piece? That would make a difference. So I'll answer the question. This is a bit of a tease. Colin and I will be coming out more publicly in a year from now. I think one thing that every employee can do, starting with the MBA classes here, is you should demand that the company you go to work for have their board of directors publish a statement of purpose, right? Like grass, grassroots, ground up, we'll take a top-down strategy with the big asset owners and asset managers. If every individual working in a company, you know, from the ground floor up demands that the board of directors publish a statement of purpose about that company, I think we can get a groundswell and we can leverage the digital technologies you're talking about and time is up, and I'd like to thank my panel very much. You were great. <laughs>